Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I want to talk to you about contingency EVAs on the Space Shuttle. That is, emergency situations where there were mission rules that would allow the astronauts to go outside in spacesuits and fix something to save the mission. And I owe this idea to Wayne Hale, who runs a blog, and he was uh, played many key roles in the uh, Space Shuttle missions. He has some great stories to tell, and this week he published a story about the situations in which an astronaut would be permitted, in fact required, to fly inside the space shuttle's payload bay during landing, a re-entry and landing. He would be wearing a spacesuit, of course, but this was a contingency procedure to solve a problem that would leave them stuck back there. And so it wasn't just something that was a like crazy idea, it was something that might have been required to save the mission. Now, during the space shuttle program, EVAs were part of many, many missions, but even on missions where there were no scheduled or planned EVAs, there were suits on board and astronauts were trained for a number of situations where they would need to use them. These were referred to as contingency EVAs and they were largely reserved for things which could destroy the spacecraft during re-entry and landing. Because they were so critical, they were actually exempt from some of the normal mission rules that would say apply to regular scheduled EVAs. For example, they're supposed to involve two astronauts that if one gets into trouble, the other can help them out. But with the emergency EVAs, there were it was actually acceptable to have only one astronaut out there because they might need the other one in the cabin doing things and on some of the early missions there were only two astronauts on board. There were cases where or there were rules which would allow um, EVAs even if certain backup systems were not functioning correctly. And if the situation was sufficiently dire and time was short the astronauts were permitted to cut down on the amount of uh, oxygen pre-breathing they would require before putting on a spacesuit because the cabin of the space shuttle is regular sea level atmosphere with 80% oxygen, but the spacesuits run one third of an atmosphere pure oxygen. And if you depressurize from one to another, you can get the bends. Now I dug through a bunch of historic documentation from the space shuttle program and the, the situations I can find are all things like uh, the payload bay doors not closing or locking correctly, some situations with the payload bay radiators that would stop the doors closing, because of course the payload bay doors are pretty important to the aerodynamics. Uh, if the manipulator arm was stuck out, that would stop the payload bay from closing. If it had a payload stuck on the end of it and they couldn't release it, again, they might have to manually do that. Antennas might get in the way of the, pay the payload bay doors. They might be stuck in docked to the International Space Station or Mir because of course this is a historic document. Um, on the other side of the spacecraft there were a couple of places where the external tank mated to the spacecraft and those of course would require passage through the heat shield and those would close up. If those were not closing correctly they would have to figure out how to shut those. And of course, after the loss of Columbia, they added a number of EVA um, you know, training rules where they would go underneath the spacecraft and try to patch up the heat shield. Now, regardless of the rest of the mission, there would be crew members that would be trained in these procedures. And you can go and find these manuals and go through the checklist and you can read the exact procedures which they would have used. For example, yet yeah, in the case where the space shuttle was stuck, docked to the mirror, there's a procedure to take that apart and it required un uh, loosening 96 bolts. And so the procedures have the exact order you have to remove the bolts, how many times they have to be turned, what torque you should use. But um, you know that one was obviously never used. The cases where I can find the use these EVAs was um, there was a case where the KU band antenna broke and was stuck, but this happened during STS-49, which was actually a pretty eventful mission in terms of planned EVAs. That was ones where they were testing fabrication, uh, you know, construction techniques outside, and it was also the one case where they had three astronauts outside at the same time, all of them of course working together to grab a spacecraft that was spinning in space. But yeah, in that case, they just had to take time out to wander over to the other corner of this payload bay and close down the antenna and stow it correctly so that the payload bay door could close. 
And in 2005, the return to flight after the Columbia disaster, astronaut Stephen Robinson went outside and he went underneath the spacecraft to look at the heat shield and remove some spacers or gap fillers which were protruding between a pair of tiles. Now, these may, may or may not have actually threatened the mission itself, but NASA was understandably eager to demonstrate that their new heat shield inspection capabilities uh, would be useful. So this was a great example. They went out using the new boom that would have allowed them to get underneath. And uh, yeah, he repurposed and improvised some tools so they could take these things out. And of course, the spacecraft returned home just fine. Now, prior to this mission, getting to inspect some part of the space shuttle could have been really, really difficult. And in fact, in the investigation into the loss of Columbia, there was a group that investigated the possibility of making a repair to the wing uh, leading edge in space. And they had to come up with a way to reach the leading edge of the wing. Columbia did not have the manipulator arm. So the plan that the, they came up with, the hypothetical plan, obviously, which was never performed, they would take the ladder or one of the ladders from the flight deck and unscrew it and bring that outside and then strap it onto the edge of the payload bay doors and they would be able to climb down that and get to the leading edge of the wing where they would fill the hole with ice and uh, you know, other junk to try and give some level of protection. Even if this had been thought about at the time, it's likely it wouldn't have happened because it was considered more risky than trying to rush a space shuttle through processing and run a rescue that way. But the crew did train for the case where the external tank umbilical doors wouldn't close. Uh, these are two doors that are towards the rear of the heat shield and they basically provide the conduits through which the external tank mates to the rest of the spacecraft where all the propellant flows through. And of course, these are doors through the heat shield and they have to be closed, otherwise your spacecraft is not gonna return from space. So, of course, this is on the underside and getting to them could be hard. If they had the manipulator arm, it was possible to get kind of get into that area. But if they didn't, Apparently, and, and this is what I've read and I've seen mentioned in a couple of places, they had to kind of improvise a grappling system, basically to sling a rope out there. And the instructions for this are they would take a bag and they would stuff it with clothes that weren't needed, like dirty laundry essential, put it on the end of a rope and then swing this around and try to hook it over into the gap between the ailerons and the elevons at the back and then they would pull that tight and that would provide them a rope that they could cross uh, and sort of get closer to the target. I'm not totally clear on this but this is what I've read. Uh, I've looked for the exact manual and it appears that the modern ones don't have this because they of course had the inspection boom by that point. So if anybody actually has any better pictures on this I would love to know more. Anyway, the payload bay doors were generally considered to be the most likely source of any you know, need for a contingency EVA. They were very large and they were critical to flying the spacecraft in the atmosphere. If those were not closed, the aerodynamics of the shuttle would be ruined more than they are already ruined. So it would be catastrophically bad, I would imagine. Uh, the, the doors were very large. They had thermal issues early on where sometimes they would warp under the heating of the sun. Uh, so as well as, uh, of course, they would have mechanical systems to open and close them one at a time. And if those failed, they would have to come up with an alternative mechanism. Then they had to latch them all the way along and there were several sets of latches. And if any of those latches had failures, they would have to come up with a way to clamp them. So, yeah. EVA would be required potentially. They could unlink the doors from the, make it, from the motion mechanism and hand crank it if the motor was wrong. They could uh, actually just cut the linkages to that and then if necessary they would use a winch and they would run a rope up to the top of the door and then winch it in by hand. If they were going to latch it, they actually had a set of clamps that could be used to latch any single one group. And that would be enough to consider, that would be enough to get them home in theory. And of course, because the payload bay doors also include the radiators, they're a critical part of the thermal control system. So as soon as those doors close, 
and get locked. The astronaut would, would have to rush back through the airlock, get out of his EVA suit, get into the uh, you know, launch and entry suit, get into their seat and you know, make their way to landing. But it was possible that once those doors got closed, that there was no way for the astronaut in the back to move forwards to the airlock. There were some things they put inside the payload bay which were as wide as the payload bay and didn't offer enough room for the astronaut to move past it. One thing would be the space lab. The space lab was essentially extra space for experiments that would be carried in the back and you would go down a little passage to get to it. Now that couldn't be ejected in flight. So if the astronaut had to deal with a pair of latches at the rear of the cargo bay, do payload bay doors, and had to latch those, well, at that point, they cannot move forward. So they're stuck in the back. And of course, the spacecraft has a time limit. They have to get down before the uh, thermal control situation gets out of, out of line. And yeah, so they would sit there, wait, and just hang out during re-entry and landing. And it wouldn't be so bad because, you know, there's plenty of things for them to grapple onto and strap themselves down. Uh, it would be kind of dark, I guess, but the space suit would keep them pretty comfortable initially. So the space suit, of course, has plenty of air, has plenty of oxygen and carbon dioxide scrubbers. They'd be fine there. It keeps them cool using something called a water ice sublimation cooler, right? that is a, basically a porous membrane, porous metal membrane where you put water and the water sublimates out and it keeps you very, very cool. But that relies on a vacuum. So they would be fine initially, but as they started coming down into the atmosphere, the atmospheric pressure would stop the cooling system working and they would start to heat up very quickly. So in anticipation of this, the astronaut would have to actually set their cooler to work extra hard beforehand so that they would chill themselves down, so as if they were on a frosty, frosty day. And then once they started heating up, they wouldn't have any way to cool down until they got to the ground. Then he, they would be sure the atmosphere, atmospheric pressure was high enough, they could take their helmet off, and then they could struggle out of that suit. It wouldn't be easy because spacesuits are generally designed to be removed with help, but they would certainly have plenty of time to do it because actually opening those payload bay doors once they had got back on the ground, that's definitely something that was left as an exercise for the engineers on the ground. They, you know, they would have to figure out how to possibly remove clamped latches or something else. So yeah, uh, that would be the case where a brave shuttle astronaut would have to ride in the back of the space shuttle instead of, you know, in the cabin with everyone else. So while no astronaut was ever required to do that, I want to finish up with the story of Story Musgrave on STS-80. This would be his final shuttle flight. And he decided, in all his years of experience, not to return to his seat when the fastened seatbelt sign was illuminated for landing. Now, he stood at the back of the flight deck looking up through the windows in the top of the spacecraft. He had the video camera in hand and he was really interested in the plasma streamers coming over this top of the spacecraft. From that vantage point, he was able to film them and he was the only person that's ever really seen them with his, with his own eyes, right? But yeah, he had to stand there during the entire re-entry and landing. And this is not a trivial thing because during re-entry, the peak G loads can get as high as two Gs. And he's experiencing this after spending two weeks in zero G. He's also wearing a rather heavy launch and entry suit. And the launch and entry suits, of course, those are quite hot. They're supposed to have their own cooling system, but they have to be plugged in. And where he was standing, there wasn't any place for him to actually plug in and cool down. So he was taking the heat. He was standing at extra high Gs. And by the way, when he did this, he was 61 years old, right? God, I mean, I hope I can do it at that age. This dude is like an astronaut legend who basically surfed back from space at Mach 20 in a flying brick. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>